Journal number four, continued, Dendron. Good day, Queen Kagan, shouted Rellin from the center of the stadium. This was probably the first time a Malago miner had addressed a Bedouin monarch, ever. It was probably going to be the last. Rellin had everyone's attention in the stadium. I hope that he had a lot to say, because if he decided to keep it short and reached for the, bottom but for the bomb button, my plan had no chance of working. But if he took this opportunity to say what was on his mind and make some kind of grand political statement for the history books, then maybe we'd have a chance. For my plan to work, we each had a different task. Unfortunately, my job was probably the most dangerous. It's not that I wanted the most dangerous task, but it was the only job I was capable of pulling off. Lucky me. I quickly told my idea to Uncle Press and Lore. They didn't even stop to discuss it. The time for debate was over, and since nobody had any better ideas, my plan was a go. The plan called for the three of us to split up. Before we had the chance to share a good luck or a goodbye, Lore was off and running. Typical. Uncle Press didn't run off as quickly. He stayed long enough to give me this look of uncle-like concern. I felt like I needed to say something important, but the only thing that came to mind was, I really wish you would let me go to that basketball game. Okay, maybe not the most eloquent last words, but it was how I felt. Uncle Press smiled and said, No, you don't. Then he took off running. I hesitated a moment because, well, I was scared. But I also had to think about what Uncle Press just said. Sure, if I had gone to the basketball game, I wouldn't be lying here facing certain death, but that's not where my head went. This is going to be hard to explain because I'm not really sure I understand it myself. But as dire as the situation was, it somehow felt right. Believe me, it's not like I was having fun or anything. Far from it. But when I took a few seconds to do a gut check, I got the strange feeling that this was the right place, no, the only place for me to be. What was that traveler model? motto? This is the way it was meant to be? Okay, stupid motto, but it really felt to me as if this is the way it was meant to be. I don't mean to make this sound any more dramatic than it was, but the word that came to my mind right then was destiny. Maybe this was my destiny. Now I could only hope that I'd get the chance to play a basketball game again sometime, but that wouldn't happen if I didn't get moving, so I jumped up and ran to do my part of the plan. As I ran along the top of the stadium, I wasn't worried about getting caught because all eyes were focused on Rowan. It must have been amazing for the, pe the Bedouin people to see this Malago miner addressing their queen. It was a spectacle that never would have happened if Malice hadn't orchestrated it. I guess that's the kind of thing Uncle Press was talking about when he said the Malice never did any of his own dirty work. He said how Malice would influence others to do it for him. Well, Rellin was definitely about to do some dirty work, courtesy of Malice. People of Denderon, Rellin continued, I come before you today with a gift that is more valuable than you can imagine. It seemed as if Rellin was indeed about to give a speech. That was good. Hopefully he was long-winded because I had no idea how much time it would take to pull off my plan. My gift is more valuable than the glaze you see before you, he bellowed. It is more valuable than all the glaze that has ever been taken from the mines. It is the gift of a wonderful future, and it is for all the good people of Dendron to share. Was this guy dramatic or what? Well, why not? He wasn't planning on being around long enough to hear any bad reviews. This was his moment in the spotlight. Keep going, Rellin, I thought. Make it good and long. As I ran, I saw that Laura and Uncle Press had already managed to pull off the first part of their jobs. They had each snuck up on a Bedouin knight from behind, whacked them, and taken their armor. They needed to wear the armor so they could make their way down to the stadium field without being noticed. That's why I gave them the jobs I did. There was no way I could knock out a knight and steal his armor, and even if by some miracle I was able to do that, I was too small. If I put on the armor, I'd look like a little kid wearing his daddy's clothes. No, I had another job, and I knew exactly where I had to go. It was only yesterday that I had been there. At the time, I swore never to go near the place again, but here I was, headed right back. It only took me a few minutes to get there. I was pretty fast, so running 300 yards was nothing. But as I approached my destination, I had a moment's hesitation. I thought that maybe if I ran fast enough and far enough, I could survive the blast from the tack bomb. But that thought lasted only about a nanosecond. There was no way I was going to bail on the plan. At this point, it wasn't even the bomb I was afraid of. That's because I had arrived at my destination, the horrible hole that looked down into the dark depths of the quig pens. Yup, if my plan was going to work, I was going to have to climb down there and make my way to the stadium through a minefield of hungry quigs. And I didn't have my trusty whistle to protect me either. This could hurt. I stood on the edge of the hole, trying to get the nerve to climb down. 
The rope ladder was in a heap at the bottom of the hole, right where it had fallen yesterday. But the thick rope that Lore had climbed to make her escape was still hanging there. That was my ticket down. I had to stop worrying and kick myself into gear because Relin could hit that button at any second. So I grabbed the rope, swung my legs over, and slid down the rope into a, the pit of hill. When I got to the bottom, the first thing that hit me was the smell. It was as nasty as I had remembered it. Then I realized I had landed in a puddle of some kind of thick brown goo. I realized what it was, and I nearly barfed. It was a congealed pool of blood from the quig that Uncle Press had skewered. I fought back the rising puke and quickly looked around. The injured quig wasn't there. Maybe it was dead. Better still, maybe it had been eaten up by the other quigs. Can you believe this was the way my mind was working now? My next goal was to get to the door that led to the stadium as fast as possible. I couldn't sneak quietly through the quig pen. No, I had to beat feet and get there fast. So I took off running in the direction I remembered traveling the day before. The run through the quig pen was terrifying. As I rounded each turn in the labyrinth, I kept expecting to see a monster quig waiting there with its mouth open, ready for dinner. My adrenaline was pumping so hard, I don't think I could have walked slowly and cautiously if I'd wanted to. I should have been exhausted by now, but I wasn't. Fear will do that. If a quig didn't get me, then the bomb would. I wasn't sure which would be more painful. My guess is that the bomb would be quicker, but I forced those morbid thoughts away because the goal was to stay alive, not choose the least painful way to die. After a few more turns, I saw the door to the stadium. I had made it. Believe me, I never thought I'd get this far. I ran to the huge door and put my ear to it. I could hear Relin still giving a speech. That was good. But there was another sound I wanted to hear as well. The job I had given to Laura was to get down to the stadium floor and unlock the door. That wouldn't be easy because as soon as she started to lift the heavy latch, somebody would certainly see her and try to stop her. Timing was everything. If she opened the door too soon, my plan would fail. If she opened it too late, my plan would fail. There was a small window of opportunity, and it was getting close. I listened again, and that's when I heard it. Two quick raps on the door. That was the signal. Excellent. Lore had made it and was standing outside. Now she had to wait for my signal before opening the door. Of course, she had no way of knowing if I was on the other side or not. For all she knew, I was being murdered on by, or munched on by a quig who had a surprise treat fall into its lap. Still, I knew it didn't matter. She would stand there until I signaled for her to open the door or the bomb blew up, whichever came first. Now came the hardest part of all. Talk about a gut check time. Everything that I had done up to this point was easy compared to what I had to do next. I looked around for something to help me and found a, mental shield, a metal shield that one of the Bedouin knights had dropped yesterday before he came, became quig food. I needed something else too. I hoped to find one of the knight's spheres, but for some reason they were gone. Time was running out. I had to move faster. I looked around again and saw the perfect thing. It turned my stomach to use it, but I couldn't let my squeamish belly stop me from doing what I had to do, so I picked it up. It was a leg bone. A human leg bone. As disgusting as it was, it was exactly what I needed. At least this one didn't still have the foot attached. I fought back my disgust, took a few steps back into the cavern, and rang the dinner bell. Yes, I was using myself as bait. I used the leg bone to bang on the metal shield and hopefully wake up any napping quig that had missed my crazed run a few seconds before. Come on, I shouted. Come and get it. Tasty meat, right this way. This was insane. Think about it. I was putting myself out there to be eaten by a beast that had already devoured three people. My hands were shaking with fear. Whose idea was this, anyway? Oh, right, mine. I banged on the shield a few more times and the annoying sound echoed throughout the cavern. Another horrible thought went through my head. What if they could hear this from the stadium? If there was even a hint of a problem, Rellin would hit the button and the game would be over. Let's go, I shouted. Come on, you losers. I'm the gil who, a guy who killed your buddy up on the mountain. Come and get me. It came without so much as a warning. Yesterday when the quig attacked Uncle Press, it stalked him cautiously and slowly until it was close enough to pounce. That's not what was happening now. From far back in the depths of the rocky labyrinth, I heard the bellow of a quig that was already charging. Maybe it was because of the annoying sound of the shield. Maybe it was my yelling. Maybe it was ravenously hungry. I'll never know. But whatever I had done, it worked. A quig was now charging toward me at a dead run. I could hear its giant paws pounding on the rocky surface as it rumbled closer, ready for the kill. Now was the time. Now was the window of opportunity. Lore had to open that door fast or I'd be lunch. I dropped the shield, ran to the door, and gave the secret prearranged signal for Lore to do her thing. Open the damn door! I yelled as loud as I could. How's that for a secret signal? Lore got the message. With my ear to the door, I heard her fumbling with the heavy lock. 
This was the same lock that it took two nights to lift. I hoped that Laura had the strength to do it by herself. Uncle Press could have helped, but he had his own job to take care of and was probably nowhere near the door. It was all up to Laura. Hurry! I shouted. This was one time I didn't care about sounding cool or confident. I wanted her to know how close I was to being eaten. I heard a roar, turned back to look into the quig pens and saw it, the quig. Its yellow eyes blazed as it charged through the pools of light, picking up speed, lusting for the kill. It was getting close enough that I could see bits of saliva flying from its open mouth. This thing was hungry and I was dinner. I threw my back against the door, hoping it would open. It didn't. I could hear Lore struggling with the lock. If she took any longer, someone would surely see her and stop her. Or Rellin would push the button. One way or another, this would be all over in a few seconds. The quig crouched lower to the ground. It was getting ready to pounce. If you don't open the door, I shouted, this quig is going to... With a loud creak, the door swung open and I fell back. At that exact moment, the quig sprang, but because I had fallen down, it sailed over me through the open door and into the stadium. I swear, I felt the breeze from its paws as they sailed over my head, inches from slicing me to pieces. I quickly jumped to my feet and ran into the stadium to see what was happening. The next few seconds were critical. It all came down to what the quig did and Uncle Press. The stadium was in total chaos. The quig was out of control. Several Bedouin knights ran onto the field to try and capture it or kill it. I saw that Lore had been attacked by two knights, but Lore wasn't their problem anymore. They let her go and went after the quig. I helped her to her feet, and the two of us took cover next to the open door. The monster quig had taken a stand. It went from offense to defense as the knights attacked it with their spears. I'm not sure who was doing more damage, the quig or the knights. For every spear they threw at the wild animal, the quig must have slashed two knights. It was in a total frenzy of anger, pain, and blood. But the main thing is that the battle to contain the quig had done exactly what I'd hoped it would. It disrupted the events that were taking place in the ring. I looked to the center of the ring to see what Relin was doing. He must have been momentarily stunned by the sudden appearance of the quig, because he stood there with the other miners staring at the action. That didn't last long. He snapped out of it and went for the ore car full of tack. This was it. This was the moment. Relin was going to push the button. From the corner of my eye, I saw a black streak headed toward Relin. It was a flying spear. The missile flew at the chief miner and stabbed him right in the forearm, pinning him to the side of the wooden ore car. Relin screamed out in pain, but I'm not sure if it was a scream of pain or frustration because he couldn't get to the tack bomb. Then I saw a Bedouin knight run up to the ore car, but I knew this wasn't a Bedouin knight. It was Uncle Press. He was going for the detonator. Relin couldn't move, but the other miners could. They realized what Uncle Press was doing and attacked him. These simple miners were no match for my uncle. Uncle Press was a blur of arms and legs as he took the miners on and knocked them down one by one. There was no way he was going to let any of them get to the detonator. It was an amazing sight. The Bedouin knights had all but killed the quig and Uncle Press was in full command of Relin and the miners. I couldn't believe it. My plan had worked. No sooner did I think that the worst was over than all hell broke loose again. I had forgotten there was another quig in the pen and the door was still open. The second quig charged out onto the field with just as much fury as the first, but the knights were spent and they didn't have the strength or the will to kill another quig. This was going to be a slaughter. There was nothing to do stop this murderous quig except for Uncle Press. Uncle Press had finished off the last miner, then quickly and carefully pulled the small homemade bomb out from under the ore car full of tack. Relin tried to stop him, but he was literally pinned to the wooden car and could barely move. The quig crouched down on all fours and surveyed the scene. It was looking for its first victim, and it quickly made its decision. It won on Uncle Press. Uncle Press! I shouted. Uncle Press looked up to see the quig heading for him at a dead run. Without a second of hesitation, he heaved the small bomb at the charging quig. I didn't know if he pushed the button as he threw it or not, but whatever happened, the results were spectacular and gruesome. The small bomb of tack hit the quig in midair and exploded. The force of the tack ripped the beast into and tore it apart, sending pieces of bloody quig raining down in the entire field. It was disgusting and beautiful at the same time. The quig was killed and the means to explode the bigger bomb was gone. There was an odd calm in the stadium now. It was like no one understood what had just happened or what to do next. Many of the Bedouin knights were injured or just plain exhausted from their battle with the quig. Kagan stood in her royal box looking down on the carnage. She must have been really confused because she wasn't even eating. The Bedouin spectators watched in stunned silence. 
They had no idea if what had happened was planned or some horrible mistake. Only the Novans reacted. They gave their typical polite applause. Gotta love those guys. I looked to Laura and said, What took you so long with the door? I had two knights on my back, she answered. Not only had she lifted the heavy lock, she did it while fighting off two of the Bedouin knights. Uncle Press walked over to Relin and pulled the spear out of his arm, releasing him. He then gave him a rag to tie his wound. Laura and I joined them. Nobody knew what to say. I couldn't tell if Relin was angry, disappointed, in pain, or all of the above. That's when Relin started to laugh. It was the last reaction I expected. It was the same kind of crazy laugh I had heard from him down in the mines. It was like he knew something we didn't know. Again, it gave me the creeps. Finally, Relin said, You think this is over, but it is not. Yes, it is, said Uncle Press. You have no way to explode this tack now. Relin laughed even harder. What was going through his mind? But this is not all the tack that was brought from the mines, he said. This grand weapon may have failed, but the signal had been given just the same. It was you who gave the signal, Press, my friend. The three of us looked at each other, befuddled. What was he talking about? Then it hit me. I remembered what Relin had said to me the night before. He said that as soon as his miners heard the explosion, it would be their signal to attack. And there had certainly been an explosion. Granted, it wasn't the big boom everybody was expecting, but it was pretty loud just the same. There were quig guts all over the place as proof. Could the Malago miners have heard it? The answer to that question came right away. A horn sounded from the top of the stadium. All eyes looked up to see a lone Bedouin knight standing there. The Malago! He shouted for all to hear. They're attacking! Instantly, the Bedouin knights scrambled. Even the knights who had bravely fought the quig were wounded, jumped to attention. They grabbed their spears, straightened their helmets, and quickly climbed up the stairs of the stadium. Look, said Lore, and pointed towards Kagan's royal box. What we saw were more knights, hundred of, hundreds of them, all piling out from inside the palace to join their comrades. Queen Kagan stood on her throne, laughing and clapping like a child, cheering them on. To her, this was a game. She had no idea that these men were headed into a very real battle, or maybe she just didn't care. The knights were now several hundred strong. They looked like a formidable fighting unit. They marched up the stairs of the stadium to join with their comrades and begin the defense of the palace. Then an odd thing happened. The Bedouin spectators began climbing the stairs to the surface as well. They were excitedly laughing and chatting with anticipation. They were followed in turn by the Novans. This was unbelievable. It was like they wanted to watch the battle for themselves. Did they think this was going to be a show put on for their amusement, like the Quig battles? Did they have any idea what was about to happen? Relin said, We may not have made our grand statement, but we will still have our battle. We are armed with tack, and we will triumph. Your efforts have been in vain. The battle is about to begin.